Welcome everyone to the University of Texas Energy Symposium sponsored by the Energy Institute for uh, today, uh, March 30th. Um, today it's our pleasure to have Ryan Sitton. Uh, and before I introduce him more formally, I would like to point out our speaker for next week, who is Leslie Jantarasamy, who's the Associate Director for Energy and Climate at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And as a note, uh, the following week, two weeks from now, there will be no Energy Symposium speaker, as we will be having uh, UT Energy Week, or at least for two days of sessions on April 13th and 14th. Some of it will span this time during the week, and that's free to attend. Uh, and the link to register is below, so it's free to attend, but you must register at energyweek.utexas.edu, and you can just find that by searching UT Energy Week. But today, uh, it is a pleasure to have Ryan Sitton, founder and CEO of Pinnacle. He's gonna talk about his new book, Crucial Decisions. Uh, he is the founder of Pinnacle. He has 20 of years of industry experience creating data management systems for equipment, integrity and reliability, and has served some of the world's largest companies in the oil and gas, water and mining industries. Uh, he's a leading expert in energy market and data analytics. Uh, some of you may know uh, Ryan from his time as uh, on the Texas Railroad Commission, um, he which is of course the chief energy regulator for the oil and gas industry in the state of Texas, he served in that role from 2014 to 2020. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Texas A&M, and he's working on his PhD in data science from an engineering and from the University of Tennessee. So today he's going to talk to us about how we make database decisions in complex situations. Uh, and this certainly is the case in the world of energy. Uh, what role experts play in this new data world? So um, we are here to welcome him and we'll hold questions until the end. So please, as always, submit questions via the Q&A question and answer feature of Zoom uh, while he's talking at any time. And we will uh, answer, address these questions after he's done speaking. So with that said, I'm now stopping the sharing of my screen. Uh, and Ryan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carrie, and I appreciate you having me. One year ago today, one year ago right now, coronavirus was making its way through the US and we were beginning as a society to react to this potential pandemic that we didn't know how to handle. We had watched what had happened in China. We'd heard some information, some news about what was going on in Europe. And we were watching as the, the sickness rates were something we hadn't seen in a long time. The illness rates, the treatment rates were much higher than we'd seen with the flu. And the contagion rates, the rate of spread seemed to be much higher than what we'd seen before. As a result, by April, governments around the country, both state, local, and national were instituting a set of lockdowns, saying we couldn't go into places to congregate. We had to wear masks, no groups larger than certain sizes. Schools were going from live to virtual. Businesses were moving employees virtual. The impact on the energy industry was profound. In fact, two months later, by May of 2020, oil prices had dropped from the mid 50s all the way down into the, tw to the 20s and were on their way to a historic low of negative $37 a barrel. Now, in the middle of all this, the Railroad Commission was asked to do something that it had not done in four decades. A group of oil companies came to the Railroad Commission and asked the Railroad Commission to evaluate proration. Now, if you don't know about the power of the Railroad Commission, this relatively obscure energy agency here in the state of Texas has a very profound capability, profound power. And the Railroad Commission, led by three elected railroad commissioners, can tell oil producers in the state of Texas how much oil they can produce. That power was first awarded to the Railroad Commission in 18, sorry, in 1919. Over 100 years ago, the Railroad Commission was charged with regulating the production levels of oil in the state of Texas. In fact, a lot of people don't know that from the mid 1920s all the way to the mid 1970s, that 20, that 50 year period, the Railroad Commission was the single biggest influence on the global price of oil. So here we were in the middle of 2020, 
And these companies come to the Railroad Commission and say, you need to prorate oil production again. Now, what do we do with a request like that? Keep in mind that the last time the Railroad Commission had prorated oil was in 1973, back before the two Middle East oil embargoes took a lot of US access to oil away. And at that time, the Railroad Commission raised its proration levels to 100% or its allowables to 100%. And ever since then, the Railroad Commission has not regulated the production of oil, at least from a capacity perspective. So now we are 40 years later, companies coming to the Railroad Commission saying, you need to prorate oil production. This is what I consider a crucial decision. Because if the Railroad Commission elects to establish measures to put in place limits on how much oil can be produced by operators in Texas, that will lead down a fairly, fairly different road and can have a predominant, a pretty major impact on not just the oil business or even the energy business, but the entire economy of the state of Texas. If the Railroad Commission elects not to prorate, then that will go down a very different road. And either of these roads can have a pretty long-term impact on the state of Texas. In fact, if you would have asked me uh, 10 months ago, Ryan, do you think the Railroad Commission should prorate? I would have said, I don't know, but there is one thing we should do. We should analyze the data. Because if we get this wrong, one risk is that a year from now, which would be today, the global economy could be recovering and the demand for oil could come back to pre-pandemic levels, and there won't be enough oil in the world to fill that need. When that has happened in prior years, in prior decades, that has wreaked havoc on the global economy because when energy prices soar, a lot of parts of the global economy get hurt. And so if we get this wrong, we may slow down the economic recovery. However, if we get it wrong on the other side, in other words, if we do, if we don't, if we do prorate, and we end up removing competitive advantage, competitive drivers from the state of Texas, then we could slow down Texas energy production for years to come. So there was a lot to understand about the market, about energy prices, about what was happening as a result of the pandemic. And hence, I would have told you, we have to do the data analysis. To my disappointment, the Railroad Commission did not do the data analytics. In fact, the Railroad Commissioners uh, two of the three of us felt that we couldn't respond realistically to the market at, at the rate that it was moving, and the Railroad Commission took no action, which actually is a third option in the three. We could consider proration, we could consider not prorating, and we could do nothing, which was even different than not prorating. What was the result of that? By doing nothing, I believe that the Railroad Commission has effectively done away with its power to prorate oil production forever. Because if you're not gonna prorate in the middle of the, the, the worst artificial market conditions in history, then when would you? The reason I start with this story is it's an example of how data analysis or lack thereof has profound effects on very complex situations and when you think of the energy industry, of course, we deal with complex systems every day. Just four weeks ago, we were in the middle of recognizing a new complex system that we had never been faced with before, the combination of power plants across the state of Texas freezing. And some major chunk of our electricity generation being, being brought offline, and now literally millions of Texans being faced without power in the middle of the coldest freeze in our state's history. What was missing in setting up our electricity grid and our electricity generation to deal with that situation? Or was that situation the natural extreme of a well-balanced system? Those are not questions of politics or even just of economics, but of understanding complex systems in the language of objectives. But before I go further, Let's, let's talk about something a little closer to home that may be easier to digest than these very complex notions of global energy markets and state electric grids. As, uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I got my undergrad degree from Texas A&M 20 years ago in mechanical engineering, and now I'm studying to get my PhD in data science from the University of Tennessee. 
Now, another interesting anecdote is my daughter, Sarah, is a junior in high school right now. And she is six feet tall and is a powerhouse on the volleyball court. She is also a straight A student and she thinks she may wanna study chemical engineering. Well, unlike her father, who was fairly limited in my academic options because of her volleyball capabilities and her strong academic performance, Sarah has a whole lot more options when it comes to going to school. And because of all this, she and I are having some pretty candid conversations around, Dad, what university should I pick of all the possibilities in front of me? And after all that, you just picked a university a year ago. Can we understand why you picked that university and what that might mean for me picking mine? So let me challenge you with a mental exercise to get us started. If you can read these names up here, I've got six universities and I'll ask you to rank them. How would you rank these very prominent, you know, nationally exposed universities uh, on your list? University of Texas, Texas A&M, Stanford, University of Tennessee, New York University, and Columbia. And I will tell you, of these six universities, five of them I had the option or was available to pursue getting my PhD at, and I chose the University of Tennessee. So as you rank these schools in your mind, think about how, what would be the criteria you would, we would use, or if you Google the list, what would you find? And I'll show you if you Google what you would most likely find. You find that Columbia is ranked number three, Stanford ranked number six, New York NYU ranked number 30, UT ranked number 42, Texas A&M ranked number 66, and UTK, as I call it, ranked number 112. Huh, my daughter says. Dad, because she is getting some attention from Columbia, she says, Dad, surely I would pick the number three university and not the number 42 or the number 66, certainly not the number 112, right, Dad? In fact, Dad, how is it that you picked the number 112 ranked university when you could have selected the number six? Well, if you consider these rankings, and let me dig in a little bit more to the University of Tennessee. University of Tennessee is ranked number 112 overall, number 63 in undergrad engineering, number 59 in graduate engineering. But this gigantic asterisk is that all of these rankings are based on US News and World Report, which is the most common listing that people use when they consider how a university is ranked. And back to the list here, all of these are just in their overall university rankings. One of the reasons I give you these is that most of these schools, even the ones that have a data science PhD program, their, their PhD, their data science programs have no rank. And so I just say, if you were to look up this list, this is what you would find. And Here's what I selected when I picked the school that I wanted to get my PhD from. And still, my daughter and other people may be asking, well, why, why University of Tennessee then? Because these others are much higher ranked universities. Was we consider a decision process like where to go to college, which is a pretty crucial decision in someone's life, let's unpack how US News and World Report does their rankings. You don't have to read these quotes, but what they basically say in these two quotes that these are, this is what US News and World puts out is it says, we, we look at 10 quantitative categories, they say. In other words, this is not a subjective analysis, this is objective analysis. They then say that there are things we don't consider. They acknowledge that we consider some data points, don't consider others. And this is a good example of how a crucial decision may be made based on data. And if you're going to make it based on data, make sure you understand what data you're looking at. So now I'm going to go to a really detailed list that will probably be hard to see. But this shows the overall rankings for how US News and World Report ranks its universities across the, the, across the nation. 22% of US News and World Report calculations are based on graduation and retention rates. 5% is based on social mobility, 8% on graduation rate performance, which translates into what you do after school, 20% on undergraduate academic reputation, i.e. a peer assessment, 20% based on faculty resources, things like class size, faculty compensation, 7% is based on student selectivity, i.e. how qualified, how competitive are the students that are going to these schools. 10% based on financial resources for students, 3% based on average alumni giving rates, and 5% based on graduate indebtedness. 
Now, the reason I, I go through all these with you is as I looked through these list of universities to pick the one I was going to school at, and as I counsel my daughter on selecting the university she's going to attend, the fundamental question we have to ask if we're gonna think about ratings like these is how important is this data to us? I will tell you, when I look at graduation and retention rates, I don't care about that. When I look at graduation rate performance, I don't care about that. Undergraduate academic reputation, peer review, I didn't care about that. Faculty resources like class size and uh, faculty compensation, I didn't care about that. Now, I did care about social mobility, which tells us about the average income of a student coming in and the average income of a student coming out. But in my case, I wasn't looking for a job. I wasn't gonna be changing careers. So I looked at all of these criteria, turns out that they weren't important to me. Well, what was important to you, Ryan, when you selected where to spend your time getting your PhD in data science? It was efficiency of curriculum. See, in my case, I wasn't changing jobs. In fact, this isn't really a good career move for me. I was inspired, I was excited to gain knowledge and a cross-section of knowledge from how to do data science programming in Python to how psych what psychology and behavioral economics have taught us about decision processes and how data affects the way we operate as a society and as a business. What is the most efficient way for me to learn that information and perform research to establish new ideas and new thoughts in that space. And as I looked at the universities, the University of Tennessee jumped to the top of the list. Yet that efficiency of curriculum was not in these rankings. Now others are going to have other criteria and that's great, right? All of us, as we make decisions, have to understand what data is important to our decision. Because if we don't understand that, we can react to things like simple high level numbers instead of making an analytical and quantitative decision based on the data that matches our objective. Now, let's do a quick experiment as we unpack this idea of how data is not just changing you know, our, our landscape and things like um, college selection and railroad commission regulation, but the entire landscape of the energy industry oil and gas, power generation, renewables, non-traditionals, nuclear energy. Think about things like LNG exports and import pipelines. All of the areas, all of the, the various industry segments that affect our access to energy, even consumption, efficient homes, automotive, gas versus electric. As we think about all these, we're arguably talking about the most complex systems on earth. And today I'm gonna to spend the rest of my time talking about how we use data and how that data will affect crucial decisions we make as we move forward as a society, as business leaders, and as academicians. Now, if you, this idea of, of using data to make decisions is not new. In fact, if I were to go back, say, 20, 30 years, and I was to ask you then, what makes a successful oil and gas leader? At the time when oil and gas and coal represented 98% of the world's energy consumption and nuclear. And I said, what, since oil and gas is still our largest energy source, what makes a successful oil and gas leader? In other words, what are people in those roles doing that help drive us down this road? And most people would say, well, they are objective. They're not subjective. They use logic, not emotion. They use fact versus opinion. And they do things in a quantitative way, not a qualitative way. In fact, for the last probably half a century, these basic ideas around using logic and using quantitative methods, uh, you know, using fact, trying to remove, remove emotion from, from leadership situations has been a pretty dominant theme. In fact, these gave way to what I would consider to be the, uh, the, the sort of modern sort of Six Sigma, you know, GE logic, very systematic way of leading. And as a result, this mindset led a lot of businesses to, to retool their mindset away from the, the, the very old school way of doing business to the more logic, data, quantitative driven ways. And that in turn gave way to the golden age of engineering. You know, when I graduated engineering school in 1998, engineers were being hired to go into everything, not just 
you know, oil and gas or chemical plants or automotive manufacturing. We were being hired to go into HR programs, to go to law school and med school. Everyone out there was looking for this way of systematic thinking to drive their organizations, drive their institutions. And they thought that, man, getting engineers, we'll give that to you. Because engineers are logical thinkers, we thought. Fast forward to today, and this is now a shifting dynamic. In fact, just in the last 10 years, the, the sexiness and the golden age of engineering is now giving way to the golden age of data. There is not a single company out there who's trying to position themselves for an IPO or a sale that doesn't want to tack data science or data analytics to their company name because it automatically triples the value of their company. You can look out there at publicly traded companies with very small profit margins or even losses, and yet their valuations are huge if they're in the language of data. And I submit to you that the same thing the world is looking for today, the same objective out of all of this data, is, is the, that is the same objective we were looking for 50 years ago. We want systematic ways to analyze situations using logic, using analytics, quantitative methods and facts to drive better decisions. Just in the past, we thought we'd do it with a person. Now, we need to do it with a system. And I'm gonna use something very close to home today to evidence how important this is, not just to a business or an institution or even an area of study, but to our entire society and way of life. And we'll do this experiment together. If I asked you this question, what is the probability that you will die in an accident in a year? Now, this is data that's publicly available. The, Center for Disease Control and Prevention tracks what causes Americans to die every year. If you go to the hospital or you go to the doctor or you get a death certificate and they list a cause of death, the CDC tracks those things. And so you can look and see in a given, in a year, what are the odds that somebody is going to die from an accident? And this is all accidents. This is car wrecks, uh, explosions, trips, falls, bridges, collapse, elevators, fall down the stairs. All of those combined with the odds you die in an accident in a given year. Now, if we were doing this with a little bit bigger group, I would do this in a, in a poll fashion. I would have you all on your phones, you'd enter answers. The last time I did this was with a little bit bigger group at uh, Texas A&M, as a matter of fact, college students. And I asked them, what is the probability you will die in an accident in a year? And these were the choices that they had. And here was the answers they gave. That the, the students said, 14% said one in 2000, 13% said one in 180,000. You can see the range of answers that people get. Once again, if you were to go to the CDC, which we've done, you pulled out all the data, the number of Americans who live in the United States, the number of Americans who die every year in accidents. You said, what's the percent chance that someone's going to die in an accident in a year? It's actually one in 1900. There's a one in 1,900 chance less, greater, in other words, greater probability of one in 2000 that any of us will die in an accident in a given year. Now, if you further separate this data and you eliminate the outliers, say babies at home who, whose parents are constantly vigilant or people who are not leaving the home and so aren't exposed to normal societal accidents. So in fact, if you use someone like me or a college student who's going out of the home every day and engaging in normal activities, this number drops or this number, get this, these odds get as high as one in 1,200. A one in 1,200 chance of dying in an accident. Why is that interesting? Because when I'd say these numbers to most people, they go, man, I, that's pretty high. I didn't realize there was a one in 1,200 chance I would die in an accident. In fact, we don't see a lot of news stories. We don't see a lot of government action, a lot of prevention to try and you know, stave off you know, massive uh, amounts of death to accidents. We've lived with it. We've learned to be comfortable with this level of accidents in the United States. And so we go on about our business for better or worse. Now, let me ask another question. To compare, let's take the average college student with no pre existing conditions. So, this is this. I'm asking the question now what is the probability you die from COVID in a year? So, one, you have to contract the disease, two, you, whether you get treatment or not. You contract the disease and ultimately ends in uh, death, a fatality. And once again, we've got data on this, right? We could go out and we could say, here's the average population, 18 to, 18 to 29, with no pre-existing conditions. And we say, what are the odds now that you would die, in, uh, die from COVID? Ask these college students again what your answer was. 
Now, these guys being sharp college students as they are, they recognized where I was going. They guessed correctly. They said one in 180,000. That's correct. In fact, to round up, it's one in 179,600 and change. So to unpack this one more time, the average college student with no pre-existing conditions, uh, the comorbidities as they call them if, if they're, when they're listed on the CDC uh, death certificate, has a one in 1200 chance of dying from an accident, has a one in 180,000 chance of dying from coronavirus. Yet think of the literally hundreds of billions of dollars that we have invested in economic um, downturn, in stimulus package, in businesses that have suffered and needed support money. The, the trillions of dollars as a nation we've invested for coronavirus or try to prevent coronavirus, and yet the relatively small, um, small amount of money that we invest in trying to prevent accidents. Now that is not a referendum on whether or not the activities themselves were the right ones. It's simply to understand that as we look at, if we look at data and make decisions, societal decisions, economic decisions, things that are absolutely crucial decisions, using data is vital. Because without it, we can invest a lot of money to get a little bit of result when we could invest a lot less money and get a lot bigger result somewhere else. And I believe that history will judge us not by having done necessarily the right or the wrong things in the middle of coronavirus reaction, simply that our level of response was disproportionate to the amount of risk that existed. Well, let's now jump back into the world of energy. If we're gonna make a crucial decision, there's a question to answer. What is, the, what is the, the biggest questions facing the energy industry today? Is it climate change? Is it the distribution of energy? Is it the transition from traditional energy sources to non-traditional energy sources or renewables? Is it reliability? Which I think a lot of Texans would say became the number one issue just a few weeks ago. Or is it the costs of new and transition energy that a lot of a lot of people, especially lower socioeconomic portions of our society, maybe can't afford. I will tell you that if you combine all of these, I believe that our number one question is, how do we anticipate energy markets? In fact, if you go back to all of these, how do we react to climate change? What do we do about distribution of energy in, a, in new regimes? How do we think about and affect the transition in a practical way, how do we maintain reliable, affordable energy for the average American family? And all of that rolls into this understanding of markets. Now markets a lot of times get confused by some analysts throwing a perspective or, or projected oil price out in the market or some news story around prices of oil moving. Uh, you know, you see the sensational storylines when there's you know, big investments into alternative energy or a government passes a requirement for a certain amount of energy coming from renewable. But those are not understanding the market. Those are storylines. Those are sensational points. Understanding the market is where is the world going and how do we make the decisions around how to affect our position in that market, either as a company, as, a, as an analytical institution, or as a government. Well, to understand that, I'm going to talk about objective again. If our objective is for the human race to have sufficient energy, sufficient, affordable, reliable energy, and that the human race would be able to survive and thrive for the long term, then what we have to do is take a look at where the energy consumption levels are going, not just here in the United States, but globally, as societies are transitioning away from predominantly rural and low energy consumption to more urban and high energy consumption. People are using more of almost every type of fuel around the world, except for coal, which is the only one in, in rough decline. So understanding the future of energy markets starts with understanding the, the global energy portfolio. And this graph I've shown here is the annual consumption of energy around the globe for the last 40 years, starting from 1980 to 2020, and you'll notice in here that while we've had a couple of points where we saw some flattening and even maybe a little dip, the only profound dip was in the 2009 global recession. That in general, the world uses more energy, give or take, almost every single year out of the last 40, like only one, two, three times has energy consumption dropped. For the most part, it continues to climb. So let's park that 
and assume that for the sake of argument, we're going to continue to see energy consumption grow at a, at a slow or at a fast pace, but it's going up, not down. Now let's explore what the US is doing in terms of primary energy consumption and all around the world and, and all of the sort of language around you know, renewables and transitions, everything else. This is the, the EIA's most recent projections about where consumption levels are gonna come. And you'll notice in here that uh, over the last uh, 60 years, 70 years, you've seen you know, fossil fuels become a lower and lower percentage of our consumption. And you've certainly seen renewables and other areas grow. Natural gas has actually been the biggest growth area. I wanna say fossil fuels, sorry, petroleum, um, as, opposed to, as opposed to natural gas. And also looking, looking at the, 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 the BTU level, this is on a percentage level, you'll see that while on a percentage level it may be shrinking, we're still seeing almost all of these grow except for coal. I'm gonna pause here and say, let's take a snapshot. If, I, if, we're, under, if we're understanding the world energy market, the world wants more energy, and we assume, we assume it's gonna want more energy. We also look and say, just here in the United States, yes, while petroleum oil has become a lower and lower percentage of our uh, total energy portfolio, it's still grown in terms of, for the most part, in terms of total amount of energy we're consuming. Just it's, it's grown a lot slower in a percentage rates, for example, than renewables, or even back here, the nuclear did. Natural gas, you see, is growing in huge, has been growing in huge leaps and bounds. Simple analysis, simple data, we're not even getting anything complicated yet. Just understanding energy markets. Well, what does this mean in terms of the ability to provide new energy into these markets? If we are considering cost, for example, as our ability to feed a market, let's take a quick look at that. This EIA data as of 2018, three years ago, we were watching that the, the cost of produced energy has been dropping uh, very, very boldly in solar and in wind. And you'll see that natural gas dropping slightly, but not very much. This is electricity generation. But still, to the average American, especially an American who is trying to make ends meet and balancing budgets, the, the you know, 30, 40% cheaper natural gas to wind and the 50% cheaper natural gas to solar, even though this has come a little bit closer since then, that's a, that's a big differentiator. Now, if we were to, if we were asked some people, say, oh, no, no, the, the cost of solar and wind energy, they are, um, they're, they're much closer than this, Ryan. This data can't be right. The EIA data, 2018. A couple of things that we will see skew this data sometime is when people talk about the generated power as opposed to the usable power at the end. So if you think about the cost of energy storage for renewable sources, that's adding a component of energy that may not be included in some people's numbers. Also government subsidies may not be included in some people's, or they may be adding those in to make these numbers look closer. But still, let's assume that these numbers are continuing to come down, they're getting closer and closer. The, the reality is today, power generation from natural gas is still a, a, a chunk cheaper and to the average uh, American, especially those in our, lower, our lowest socioeconomic brackets, this is a big deal. Their ability to pay for energy uh, and, and how it affects their family's budgets is profoundly affected by these types of differences. Still getting into some simple things. So now let's begin to look forward. Again, EIA data, I, I chose public data. You could go to the, this is the, this is the American Energy Information Agency. You can go to the international, um, the, IEA, which is the International Energy Agency, and they will give similar projections, different, different slightly. And you'll see now looking out by 2050, you'll see that yes, renewables is going to be growing to be arguably the largest portion of our energy portfolio by, in the next 30 years. And you'll see that, um, that in fact, on a percentage basis, renewables would go from 15% to 28%. Huge growth in alternative energy sources, something for us to look forward to. Not to be lost though, is the fact that at the same time, because the global energy consumption is growing so high that still petroleum in this model would be forecasted to grow. You'll notice that natural gas is forecasted to grow. Coal is forecasted to hold steady and nuclear is forecasted to hold steady. Now we could debate the inner, inner workings of these, uh, whether Germany really goes through its plan to roll completely off of nuclear, France, follow suit where 77% of their electricity is nuclear. Does this go down? Do we have to get that from other places? Maybe the renewables form an even bigger chunk. Maybe coal goes down. The point is, there is hard to find a scenario in which all of these energy sources are not intertwined in a global energy consumption marketplace. 
Last thing I want to cover is to understand why some of these numbers, if you're talking in the United States, will look very different than the rest of the world. And now we're starting to get some of the nuances of the energy markets. You'll notice that in this forecast over 20, 2050, where the EIA and a lot of people are anticipating for energy consumption growth to come, you'll notice the Americas is fairly small, yet almost negligible. You'll notice that in general, the advanced, uh, the advanced economies like Europe don't grow much at all. Asia is by far the largest chunk of energy growth and just behind it and a little bit of margin is the other non-developed nations. And when you look at those growing economies, the ease of deployment of something like a gallon of gas versus a complicated electric grid makes the consumption of petroleum in those areas still very attractive. Now, whether or not we believe that that is something that, that should be regulated or, or that government should take a stance on in those countries is out of our control. As Americans, we can't force those countries to do anything. So one of the, one of the, the complicated analyses that's going on around the world today is understanding how growth and energy is going to come and in which areas and whether or not they can deploy which types of energy. So how does the United States compete then? In other words, if the growing energy consumption is coming largely from other areas, Asia and undeveloped nations. And we look out there and say, how does the United States compete? I will submit to you again, that is by understanding complex systems. I've used examples from, um, from college elections, I've, I'm sorry, where you go to college. I've used examples from coronavirus. Let's try to see what we can learn from complex systems, even in very traditional energy portions of our energy economy. In fact, let's start with the good old fashioned oil and gas. And let's, let's take a step back and understand the complexity of the traditional or a simplified oil and gas supply chain. All the way from an oil well to a consumer, the steps that oil has to move through. And there's uh, 14 steps on this page. And each one of these steps is a massively complicated animal. So when you think about what it takes to get a barrel of oil out of the ground and a gallon of gasoline going into my car, that is an extremely complex system. And what's interesting about this is, this gives us a model to test our ability to analyze complex systems that can be, that can be applied to things like power grids and renewable energy sources and how wind and solar and natural gas generation and a smart electric grid all have to work together in extreme conditions. Let me, let me walk through this again. I'm gonna take one area, refining, and walk through a very short mental example of what a complex system looks like and the challenges that we face in making this one step of a 14 step process reliable and what that complex analysis means to us as leaders and engineers. So we'll take a refinery. And I'll show you a very simplified flow chart. If you've done any work in oil and gas, you'd say, okay, I see we've got distillation processes, we've got cat cracking, we've got reforming, hydro, uh, um, hydro treating, uh, coker units, vis breakers. This is a generally general overview flow diagram of refinery. But if you were to apply this to a relatively large refinery in the United States, say the, um, the Marathon Refinery in Garyville, Louisiana, or the ExxonMobil Baytown Refinery, or the Port Arthur Motiva Refinery, some of the largest in the country, at half a million-ish barrels per day, what you'd find is the number of piping, number of sections of pipe, and heat exchangers and control valves and pressure vessels and pumps that are required to make this entire process run, numbers in the tens of thousands. If you dropped into the Marathon Garyville refinery in the Marathon refinery in Garyville, Louisiana, you'd find out that the number of independent assets that make that entire plant run is something like 58,000 assets that all have to work together to bring in a barrel of oil and put out gasoline, kerosene, diesel, jet fuel, hydrogen, and the other byproducts. And if I'm gonna analyze that system, I might historically use a traditional decision process. So let's take, in fact, this complicated system and let's, let's imagine a problem happens. Let's imagine, for example, that you, you were about to do a shutdown and a repair on one of the major units in the process. And just before you took that shutdown, the plant operations people came and said, you know, 
the, the market is really hungry for gasoline. In fact, we had a weather condition happen. Refineries around the country have shut down and there's the demand for fuel is at, a, is at a real high. And we need to continue, continue to produce fuel to try to one, create a stable market and to two, capitalize on a high margin environment. So we've got this one unit that comprises say 7,000 of the 56,000 assets. And we need to make a decision about whether or not to take this shutdown or to postpone this shutdown for six months or a year. And we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars of decisions, weigh, $100 million of impact weigh on the decision one way or the other. And we might use a traditional decision process to do this, in which we would gather some information. A group of experts would get around and discuss all the various uh, com components of this situation that identify the problem, in other words, what the challenges we have to face with each of, our, with each of the, the possibilities. Let's identify all of our reasonable options, the different things we can do. Let's figure out the pros and cons for each option. And then finally, let's select what we believe to be the best path. After we've selected that, let's go back, review our process, make sure we did everything the way we think we should have, and let's make a decision and go forward. This is a relatively, relatively rote decision process that you would find in any leadership or business book for the last probably 30 years. The problem with this process is it's extremely, it's really manually and subjective driven. Back to the slide where I say, what do good leaders do, not just in oil and gas, but in energy and in complex systems? They don't use uh, emotion, they use fact, they don't use, or logic. They don't use opinion, they use fact. They're, using, they're looking for quantitative decisions. They're looking for um, objective decisions. And this process makes it hard to do this. Well, in the world of data, when you look at the data we use to make decisions around um, college decisions or the data we use, we, we could be using to make decisions around how to adjust our society to react to coronavirus, how might this decision process, uh-oh, uh-oh, bear with me. Hmm. Well, I've lost my last two slides, but we'll just go on. How might I use, my, how might I my, my adjust my decision process to, to do this differently? And I want you, I'm going to challenge you to, to mentally picture my last slide, which is four circles. And those four circles, instead of being this process, which follows the, the manual or the people decisions, it follows the data. The first circle is data gathering. I go out and gather all of the applicable data I have using new tools and new methods. I then go in and organize that data into three buckets. One, the actual data, the real data that we have. Two, assumptions that we can make, that we have confidence in. And then three, unknowns. Because either the data isn't accurate, we don't have confidence in it, or it just doesn't exist. So from data gathering to data organization, where I identify real data, assumptions and unknowns. The next step is to analyze that data. And that analysis also has three steps. The first one is algorithms, mathematical formulas that take me from one piece of data to a new piece of insight. The second piece of this third circle is expert opinion, where an expert can look at a piece of data and based on their intuition, their experience, draw a conclusion. The third chunk of this third circle is ability gaps, areas where I have data, but I don't have any analysis that I can use to process it. Finally, having gone from data gathering to data organization to data analysis, we now implement a strategy that's based on that data. And you may say, well, Ryan, that, that sounds somewhat like this, and, but I kind of get where you're going. The fundamental takeaway is going away from a human-based decision process to a data flow decision process. And in doing so, we, we do interject human opinion, but we allow the data and the parameters in these very complicated systems to make the decisions for us. In saying that, some people get really nervous. Oh my gosh, wait a minute, you're gonna let a machine make a decision? Oh my gosh, no way that's going to work. Well, we do it every day. We allow computers to make decisions about things like how much toll price to charge your car or where to ship goods because we need to get them to a different market based on your know, buying habits of people. 
And so we're not talking about removing humans from the decision process. We're talking about relating humans and the data in different ways. And this is the evolution that the entire world is going through. One last thing before I take your questions. Will this work? If you're advocating for analyzing complex markets and renewables and power grids and traditional energy sources and new regulations and cost of climate change and these very complicated models, Ryan, what are you advocating for? I'm advocating that we go away from simplified policymakers and politicians advocating on simple ideas in which usually the shortcomings in their logic will have a lot of pain to understand these much more complicated models and using these data-focused and data-driven decision processes to inform our behavior. And if you say, well, man, that, okay, but how do we know that will work? In 1979, a guy named Bill James wrote a series of papers, or starting to write a series of papers, in which he advocated that the world of Major League Baseball was looking at the wrong statistic, 1979. For the most part, Bill James was kind of uh, ignored as a heretic. Of course, we look at runs batted in. Of course, we look at, um, at hitting percentage. Yet Bill James said, this is, not, this is not the right data. If you want to win baseball games, you've got to look at a different set of data because a different set of data will tell you about how your players make up a team better than these other statistics. It wasn't until 2002 when Billy Bean was the general manager of the Oakland Athletics where he said, I can't afford to do business the old way. I have to adapt my processes to the new way. And he began to pull out Bill James' logic and apply it to his baseball team. Uh, Billy Bean was so successful that his team would go on that next year to set the record for the longest winning streak in American League history. And if you've seen the movie Moneyball or read the book Moneyball, you'll know the story I'm talking about. Now, not only did Billy Bean revolutionize his own baseball team, but he would revolutionize the entire world of baseball. And today, if you're going to watch a game today, every single baseball team, almost every basketball team, every football team is using the data analytics that were pioneered by Billy Bean to affect their baseball teams. After the book, book Moneyball was written by the, about the 2002 Oakland Athletics, in 2017, the book Astro Ball was written about how the Houston Astros brought in Alexander, Alec, uh, Andrew Lunau and Sid Madoff and took what Billy Bean had done and put it on steroids, even more advanced analytics and how they look at their players, where they swing the bat, when they have them go on base, how they shift their position in the field. So when I asked the question, Ryan, is this going to work? I'd say it's working already. We've had the guts to use it in areas like baseball where the outcomes are not life and death or economic ups and downs, as we apply this kind of logic to more and more complex situations in the rest of our lives, I think we're going to see outcomes we've never seen possible before. And if we wanted to, uh, it, it, in fact, I believe in this so much that last year I wrote the book, Crucial Decisions. And it was a book based on, based on all applying these data analytics and these, um, these models that we've seen in places like Amazon and baseball and other areas to the most complex systems that the human race has invented today. And if you have a chance to, to, to put your hands on the book, you'll find a lot of examples which unpack this exact thing. And I'll end with this final point. The reason I think this is so important is we are reaching an age where, where our systems are more complicated than they've ever been. And we have to make decisions faster than we ever have. This isn't my pitch as to what I think is going to happen in the future based purely on, oh, you know, maybe this happens. I believe this is absolutely the future of energy markets. The question is not if, it's a question of when. All right, what are your questions for me? Thank you very much for the uh, entertaining and enlightening presentation. So we do have some good questions from, from the audience here. Uh, first one, uh, maybe one you get. Uh, a lot, uh, being former railroad commissioner, someone talking about data science, important of making decisions based on data. The question essentially surrounds, uh, the short answer version is, does the railroad commission collect enough data for people to make appropriate decisions? Uh, the, the longer question is, uh, for example, railroad commission does not require operators to turn in a standard set of geophysical well logs or water quality samples, and this limits geologic mapping and understanding of the surface. So that's one example here. So uh, what about this 
this question specifically from your history and domain? Yeah, um, and I'll give a short answer because we're a little bit time limited, but I actually think the Railroad Commission collects, we don't have to collect any more data as a Railroad Commission to do a whole lot more analytics. In other words, we don't even do, we do almost nothing with the data that we already have. Sure, we could require a lot more data if we thought that was in the interest of good regulation. Because I, I, I will say for the point today, that, that, that the nuance of where good regulation and what data could be useful is a long debate. I will tell you today, one thing that absolutely should happen is that more analytics should go into the, rail, the data the Railroad Commission already has to draw conclusions about you know, where, where there are risks of, of, of spills, where there are risks of, um, of, of abandoned wells you know, having leakage, where there are, uh, where, where, um, where you could, based on what's already happened, they already have, where you could have um, you know, communication between wells or where grid spacing could be a little bit more efficient for field rules. So long way of saying, yes, I think we have enough data to do some really powerful analytics, but today the Railroad Commission doesn't do it. Thank you. Yeah, some of the question was implying things like understanding, placing environmental wells, understanding how to place injection wells and understand casing requirements. So thanks for addressing that sort of safety yeah. concern. Um, another one here is maybe a question I was going to kind of ask, and it's related um, in terms of your probability, your the, the example you posed and the probability of dying from COVID versus all accidents. And then the person here is asking about, do you see it as appropriate? One short question, then I'll get to a more general one. You know, what about seatbelts as an example of a government, uh, you know, regulation or intervention to say, yeah, we're going to save some lives here, extend that to airbags. Uh, but slightly more in-depth question: How do we see the, let's just say, probability of dying from one specific item versus the probability of dying from a whole suite of items? So let's just say I have a chance of dying from COVID, but I also have a chance of falling off my ladder. Uh, the probability of me dying from Ladder fall plus COVID is higher than both of them, uh, which maybe seems to, I was thinking is maybe the case in the example that you were giving. Uh, so can you elaborate on those two ideas? Sure. Uh, I think the first question was, what, Ryan, what do, you, what do you think about seatbelts? Sure. I mean, governments are making calls every day to try to drive safer behaviors, right? And even in the conversation about seatbelts, if you look back in history, you know, one of the arguments about seatbelts was not just that it protects you, the driver, but it protects other drivers because if you're not wearing a seatbelt, you've got greater odds of losing control of the car and impacting somebody else. So seatbelts is a good example. And the net cost of putting in place seatbelts was almost negligible. So it's a good example, actually, to my point, if our objective was to go out and save the most number of lives, and in fact, if you get into the way Department of Transportation looks at, or EPA, looks at, uh, looks at the value of life, they actually don't just look at the value of a life individually, they look at the years of quality life. So is this something that affects not just a certain age population? Because a, a, a brand new baby, right, has 80 years ahead of it, whereas my mother, for example, who has, um, who, who is, is, uh, has Alzheimer's living in a facility, she doesn't. So my mom would tell you, you know, prioritize the younger life as, as over mine. And, and there, are some, there are some analyses that go into that. My point being, yeah, if we're doing really good engineering, really good analytical object analysis, we say, how do we achieve our objective? Where would we put our resources to try to improve or save or, um, or, or put the most, make the biggest impact on the, the numbers of years of quality of life around the country? You could look at things like, so we, we spent a lot of time and money and effort on coronavirus, but areas like treating diabetes, or uh, other accents we could prevent, the, or, or cancer research, all the places that could have gone that may have actually saved more lives or had a bigger impact on life, but that analysis was never done. So why, the reason I use that as an example and, and kind of weigh into all of the, back to your point, Kerry, about you know, competing things, what we should be doing is if we're going to, as a society, put resources, time, energy, money into something, hopefully it's having the biggest impact and I think what, how history will judge us is that, that we did not get the impact that we could have gotten out of our investments into, into coronavirus. And that's admittedly conjecture, right? I'm trying to speculate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, let me ask a general question with the coronavirus as an example of, let's just say, something new in which we, let's just say, effectively have no data. So is, for something new that comes up, given that there's very little known about it, 
is this a time when you say, okay, I'm going to invest some more resources in retrospect, it might look like a lot of resources were spent, but at the time it was like, well, I just don't know. And we have to spend some resources to learn something that's completely new is how do you see that? What the value of new information, I guess you could say. Yeah, there's a, in fact, there's a say statistics, you know, this is kind of a Bayesian question. How are you using new information to affect, you know, what initial assumptions you have? If in, in the book, Corona, uh, Crucial Decisions, I unpack this quite a bit because it's, it's pretty amazing how much we knew in April and May of last year. Already data was pouring in, not just from uh, China and from other you know, countries in Europe, but even in the United States. Now our sample size was, was relatively small, but interestingly enough, if you look, in fact, if you were to pick up the book, Crucial Decisions Today, and look at the, the data I was looking at when I wrote that book in June of last year, and compare it to what we have today, the, the, the fatality rates and the, treat, the hospitalization rates and all those sort of things, um, those, those numbers held true. So, Kerry, great question. And the answer is, yeah, you, look, we got to use whatever data we have and recognizing there's a lot of uncertainty. Back to my formula of data processing, right? If you say, hey, I've got to gather data. And then in my organization, I say I've got a lot of unknowns. And then in my, my analysis step, I've got a lot of inability to analyze that data because it's all new. Then we have to manage that uncertainty as risk. But as we learn more and we study more, we close those gaps. And the more that good data and good research proves up what proves out and, and optimizes our approach, we can make better and better decisions. I believe in the case of coronavirus, that was never done. We've been in sort of a constant reactive mode, even as we've gotten, gotten lots and lots of data, we have not changed our, we've just, either we locked down or we not, very binary, as opposed to trying different strategies to manage. And I think that's going to be arguably an area that we do some soul searching about how we would do this better next time. Right. I think that goes well in going to another question that, let's just say, related to uh, your example of the Railroad Commission discussing uh, pro rationing of oil after the mm -hmm. uh, coronavirus shutdown. Um, in some sense, there's a, there's a precedent there of the Railroad Commission did do this in the past or it has this power, uh, but maybe we have more data now uh, or more better thinking. How much, you know, how to, I guess this, this happens in the legal profession a lot, precedent, but in data analytics, making business decisions, how should we treat precedent? Maybe the railroad commission example, may, maybe something else. Um, we just talked about not having data to begin with. So that's sort of the lack of any precedent. But let's just say we have a lot of precedent for making a certain choice, but how do, how do you convince people to say, no, you gotta make a different choice this time or, or perhaps no choice, as you said. Yeah. Uh, good, good question, Karen. It's probably a good one to end on, I think, because it kind of ties into my, to what I said at the end of the talk. You know, there's, if you think, kind of take a step back and think about the world as a whole and all of the complex scenarios that are playing out around us. And, I, and I'll pick on Amazon for a minute. And I say that, I mean, in a positive way. You know, you, you go to Amazon today and Amazon comes up and says, hey, Ryan, you might be interested in these products, right? And it sometimes gets it right. And how does it know that? Because it says, here's a guy with a certain demographic and certain buying habits. And it compares me to all the other 100 million people that went to Amazon today who had similar buying habits and says, in general, these people tend to buy the same things. So I'll show these things to Ryan and I can not only optimize what products I put in front of him, but I can optimize my supply chain to get those products to him. So Amazon is doing this all the time. The one advantage Amazon has is a very large sample size. They're getting new data all the time and updating their algorithms. But that's one example. You could use grocery stores. You could use health food and disease. You could use treatment. Imagine a time when you walk into the doctor's office and the doctor says, oh, I see you've got this set of symptoms. And based on all of what's happening in the surround, in your region, symptoms that people have and ways that we're seeing success with treatment, I don't need to give you a pharmaceutical. All I need to do is drink a certain tea and it's having a positive impact on the allergies that you're experiencing. We know that from the data. So there's all sorts of opportunities in other areas the fact is, with these very complex scenarios, one thing that we're going to have to adapt pretty quickly is how we affect public policy. You mentioned carry precedent, right? We, we tend to follow precedent a lot, especially in the legal world, and that's great. But if there are new ways and inventive ways, whether it's from a regulatory perspective or from a legal precedent perspective, we're going to have to improve how we apply those in a much more expedient way. Because our, our, our government pace, our change in government pace has been very slow. And even today, regardless of your political party or, or sort of political leanings, 
it's, it's very entrenched in sort of tradi- in, in the same ideals as before. So people are in literally arguing and, and, and battling for the same things they wanted decades ago without taking a step back to go, is this the best solution to the new complicated systems that we have in front of us today? And that, that is a challenge that is not specific to any one group or any one industry. It's, it's I think, a, a one that we're going to face as a society. Right. Yeah, have time for one more? Just one more from that. I do. Go for it. Okay. So there's one here. Let's go back into the sort of global picture of energy uh, type of question. And it's about China, thinking about China's push for electric vehicles and the investments they're making in their electric grid, for example. So um, let's just call that a piece of data or at least some data. We can see what they're doing. Um, what does this tell us about what China thinks the future of energy is and you know, whether we're the United States thinking about this or just a global consumer in general or any, yeah. anybody, uh, someone hiring you to think, uh, you don't have to spill the beans too much on that, but uh, oh, no, no, actually, how, do we, yeah, how do we think about what China's doing? How's that a piece of information to make decisions on uh, the future yeah. of energy? And um, in fact, let's unpack the, the sort of China. So China's got you know, still the fastest growing economy roughly. And, um, and they're certainly, their energy consumption rate increases. It, that China and India are the two biggest by far in terms of their, their consumption, the increase of their energy consumption. And sure, look, China has been very intentional about diversifying their energy portfolio because one of the things about China is they have no oil reserves to speak of. So it's in their national interest to build uh, non, uh, uh, non-traditional energy sources, whether it's, whether it's uh, traditional like nuclear or wind, solar, whatever. However, China is also investing more money in new refineries than any other nation. So my, if you, now we're getting into conjecture, right? Trying to anticipate what, what, we don't have a lot of data on what China is doing. We have a lot of projections and a lot of anecdotes. But in the end, I, I, you, you could sum it up to, they're trying to diversify their energy portfolio, being very intentional about it. They clearly see that part of, being a, of having a st- stable energy portfolio is having a larger percentage of renewable and non-traditional energy sources. And in fact, if I were to go back in my slide presentation, much like the United States is. So I think that, yeah, to say that China is not wholly going oil and gas is obvious. And are they going to try to lean you know, have more heavily or try to shift more and more into um, electricity? Uh, uh, you know, once again, wind, solar, electric cars, probably so. Uh, if you ask me what my, what my opinion is now, not fact is, I still think they're, they're gonna leverage their strength in refining and in petrochemicals to participate in the current economy, given the, the cost basis they've already invested in the low cost of maintaining that today. Excellent. Thank you very much. So thanks for an enlightening talk. Uh, Ryan Sitton, CEO and founder of Pinnacle and former Railroad Commissioner. Thank you very much. Good to be with you, Kerry. Thanks for having me. Okay.